mežu stāvoklis, mežu nākotne, un kā jau jūs no informācijas iepriekš saņēmāt, tā tad mums šis ir zinātniskas simpozijas, kurā piedalās arī ārzemju viesi, pateicoties Amerikas brīvības fonda atbalstam, un konferences tiek translēta arī universitātes mājas lapā internetā, arī tās ierakstas būs pieejams, es šodien izsūtīju saiti arī tiem, kas nevarēja ierasties, un tad mēs tālāk pāriesim uz angļu valodu. Protams, arī vēlāk jūs jautājums varēsiet uzdot latviski, tos tulkosim, bet tehniskā problēma būs tāda, ka mikrofons būs jāaiznes pie jums, vai jums jānāk pretī, lai to varētu dzirdēt arī tieši raidē. So, dear friends, I am happy to see so many people interested in forests, and uh, I will ask to open our scientific symposium, the prorector of uh, University of Latvia, Valdis Seglinch. Good morning to everybody and, and each of you. You are welcome here at the University of Latvia House of Na Nature. It's the first building here. And uh, it's uh, in a t time we are celebrating the 100 years of our country and we are in a year of 100 year university as such, and we are constructing a building and developing, and the next building besides the science house will be ready January next year, and the fo following bu buildings will come coming in uh, years three, five from now. We're developing, and we're developing mo mostly ba based on our own resources and resources from some European fu funds and our loans and uh, state, uh, input is very li limited. We, may, we, not, we are not a rich country and we very much depend on the taxpayers and the ma money which is running around it's mo mostly based on uh, natural resources. We are substantial part is forests. From the forest resources n number of activities are depends including the number on, on inhabitants in a, in a country. We are the depopulation is very traditional and it's growing on. From the opposite, we, we can put on only the, our knowledge and science and new directions in the development and, re and develop the reasons why to stay and why to have more knowledge. Because on traditional way how developed the interactions in between the natural resources, including the forest, and society is not successful. We announced the country as very green and political goal is to be, become more green and green. From the other side, the environmental indicators demonstrate that we are on very slippy ground. Uh, it's important that we announce this and discuss it because the traditional way of the economic development can't be realized in a country not destroyed the basis for its development. Uh, there are no solutions in a society where is no number of political parties, it's 57 registered, where discussion is in between and there are no idea about the, the society and the forest as such. Probably we can found solution in a forest, forest in the future, probably it's a way how to start to think from the forest to the society, but not from opposite, from politicians and political decisions to the forest. We, much, we should know much more about the forest and where the knowledge is inside Latvia. They are accumulated during the centuries, but they are still not enough. And we should know much more about the forest and forest systems, how they work and future based not only, not only on the on the cutting or the use of forest resources, where the way out, no. Probably during today's symposium, and maybe it's not only once, 
there be new dimensions, new ideas, new observations, maybe much wider look out of the country to recognize the possibilities to work together to not destroy what we already have and have a suggestions for the politi politicians, for education, for science, where to move and what to do. We are on slippy ground and thanks for mm, all of you who are interested in and which daily duties are in spe specifically related to the education and thanks for Baltic American Fre Fre Freedom Foundation and the guests who may come here and show and demonstrate poss possibilities. They should be discussed and uh, it's only an in initiative discussion and thanks for organizers, Institute of Biology, Yanis and all of you who participate in it. And success for your discussions and hopefully for better future and better forest. Thank you. Thank you, Professor uh, Valdis Seglinc, for good welcome. And uh, now I will shortly describe the idea. I'm happy idea actually came from Maris Trusts, our very good forest ecologist and one of the best world experts in Blackstock, as you know, maybe many of you. And uh, uh, we uh, decided to use this uh, doctoral school format, which was created by rector of the university, uh, Professor Indritis Mužnieks, some more than five years ago. The idea was to put together uh, in one doctoral school to make seminars where specialists from different uh, branches uh, meet. Uh, actually, in our doctoral school, in our seminars participate uh, biologists, geographers, uh, foresters, uh, uh, some uh, hydrobiologists, and, and so. And uh, as uh, I feel quite many years uh, participating in many seminars, in many discussions, in very hot discussions concerning forestry, regulations uh, concerning forest ecosystems, I felt that uh, quite often we live in, as in uh, separate camps, uh, separate uh, uh, groups of scientists, and sometimes uh, one, the same thing we see uh, in another way, and uh, uh, even in some cases, these differences are very, very uh, large. For example, some, some are quite sure that our forests are in very excellent status. There is no problems with biodiversity. We have very rich biodiversity and no problems for that. Uh, some are uh, thinking that we, are, we have real problems and um, many species are going down. And, uh, at the same time, of course, forestry is very important for the economy. And uh, from other side, biodiversity is also very important uh, for uh, forest ecosystems uh, uh, to keep sustainability. Uh, we see now new challenges concerning the climate change. Again, if we speak about climate change, uh, I heard several times that uh, even uh, the methods how to increase uh, the input from forests uh, to mitigate uh, climate change differs, considerably differs, and quite often proposals came in confrontation which came from biodiversity and which came from the forestry sector. And for this reason, I uh, think it's very good uh, to come together and uh, to discuss scientifically based conclusions, to compare uh, conclusions uh, from uh, very different uh, studies. And I am very happy about this possibility by the support of uh, Baltic American Foundation to uh, 
uh, get uh, our guest, uh, well-known uh, forest ecologist uh, from USA, uh, Nico Ar Artilla, and uh, we get also Michael Mountain, who is a very experienced and high-level uh, scientist with experience. He worked previously in the uh, Swedish Agriculture University, and now he is working in uh, a Lithuanian Institute. I think he will tell uh, prices, <laughs> pricelessly uh, the name of the institute. So, and so we shall probably get overview, wide overview, uh, how solutions are made uh, in other countries. What the overview? What's going on in uh, in uh, global scale? Uh, how to find these uh, compromises? Uh, between need for timber and other uh, sources from the forests and to save the bi uh, save biodiversity. And uh, for this reason, we uh, made selection uh, also of uh, case studies in Latvia, uh, invited also speakers from Forest uh, Research Institute Silova. And uh, I hope we shall have interesting uh, different conclusions from from these case studies. Uh, we shall have possibility to discuss uh, them uh, in the afternoon uh, after the presentations, and we have plan uh, to make excursion tomorrow to show different types of forests and different status of forests, uh, intensive forestry some uh, sites and uh, some, uh, some selective cutting or, or some partly protected forests and almost untouched forests for a long time. Uh, so after this uh, excursion, uh, we shall return here for final con um, discussions and conclusions. And one of the targets of this symposium is to find uh, uh, questions uh, and uh, study uh, uh, hypotheses to be um, uh, still to be researched in the future, where the views are very different, where are very different uh, uh, impressions about the status, and uh, and if it is even possible to find compromises. Uh, so I, I hope that uh, from this uh, meeting we shall better understand uh, each other uh, coming from different uh, backgrounds, from forestry background or biology background or geography background, and it will help us uh, in our further discussions because I think that uh, uh, after New Year, hopefully we shall have uh, new government and I think that we shall have again discussions what should we change in our forest uh, regulations and uh, as I remember from uh, last autumn there are many times science is mentioned we have to be based on scientific conclusions and so uh, I think that uh, also this symposium will help for that. Uh, so concerning technical things, I already told that uh, if you would like to ask uh, the lecturer questions that you have, one microphone is on the, at the end there and one is here. So uh, please show, uh, show hand and I will, somebody from us give you the microphone. Uh, concerning lecturers, uh, I hope every Everybody will look to the time schedule. Uh, we have to uh, fit in our plan according to the program. And uh, at the end of each uh, lecture presentation, there will be possibility for questions, but I will look strictly to the time left. Uh, that uh, ne next uh, presentation could be started at the time what is planned. Uh, Concerning tomorrow uh, excursion, uh, I already informed before the symposium that uh, uh, places in the bus are 
very limited priorities for students and lecturers, but we, uh, we get and, uh, some, some more places and uh, it is included. And everybody who is not, uh, who have not place in the bus, but who is going uh, tomorrow and participating uh, by own car or by some group of people in some minibus or so, uh, please uh, took map, Ilze has map at the registration desk. Uh, you will see there's six points and, uh, uh, you, uh, and we shall meet. Uh, actually, bus will start from here, from the university at eight o'clock and I hope that we'll be, we will be at the first point. It is uh, uh, across Lielupe, across uh, Kauguru uh, channel, uh, just after that, on the left side in Forest Road uh, where it starts. And I hope that we can meet there at nine o'clock and uh, start discussions in this point already. Uh, wait for, for hopefully all. And uh, then we sh I, I will tell on this uh, route, uh, I think on that place uh, and uh, show the roads we shall go. Actually, we shall go around the Temeri National Park after that, partly going in, uh, in the park. So uh, please took maps, uh, uh, the, those who are going tomorrow. Uh, yeah, I hope it's the uh, most important information and uh, uh, I then ask uh, uh, I will ask uh, the first presentation of a guest from University of Georgia, Nico Arzilla, on forests for the future. Thank you very much. It's an honor to be here. Um, I especially want to thank University of Latvia organizers Janis and Maris and um, everyone else who's helped organize this, and especially the Baltic American Freedom Foundation who's provided the funding support. And I am greatly looking forward to learning more about uh, Latvia's forest from a lot of the experts in the room today and from students and all of our discussions. Um, I just wanted to start on a cheery note about <laughs> acknowledging the ongoing extinction crisis that does not get enough attention in the news, um, or when it does, it's sort of gloom and doom. Um, I would like to focus on this happening as a means of doing something about it so with practical examples and experiences, and so that is what I hope to bring um, to the table today. Um, and specifically, I'm looking forward to learning more about Latvia's forest myself. I've spent um, some time in the last year or two learning, and I know I will learn much more today, and I hope many of you do as well. Um, about 50% of Latvia is forest. It's a forest country. That means sustainable forest management is extremely important um, for the economy, which is usually the focus in forest countries, but also for biodiversity, which is the focus of my talk um, and many of the talks today. Um, recent forest management in Latvia has increased considerably, as particularly on private lands and particularly since the 2008 uh, financial crisis from which much of the world has not recovered. Um, and so the focus tends to be on economic benefits in the short term instead of long-term sustainability. And I'm hoping we can help inform a shift towards sustainability. Um, so the logging intensities have tripled um, since Latvia's independence, um, and this contributes to high levels of fragmentation and losses of forest biodiversity. Um, and we want to be looking at ways that we can help change that. Um, 
My talk, I will spend um, giving you some examples and an international perspective about um, using birds as indicators of forest ecosystem integrity and looking at the impacts of logging on birds and what they tell us about the forests and the long term and the big picture of how to manage them and keep them for the future. I wanted to include this very nice photo of black storks in Germany because uh, black storks in Latvia too are wonderful indicators of forest status. Um, in the last 24 years, I understand the populations of black storks in Latvia have gone from healthy populations to critically endangered. They've lost about 66% of their population, and I don't think the trajectory has yet changed, but I hope that many of the people in this room can help change that for the better. Um, I wanted to open just by talking about the Environmental Performance Index. This is an index that was developed by Yale and Columbia Universities in the United States to try to compare um, countries globally in terms of 20 measures of environmental performance. Um, Latvia in the pilot version was ranked as second in the world, and so this got a lot of positive attention um, in terms of doing very well with forests. Um, and this was repeated in the media. Unfortunately, um, in, by 2014, they had adjusted the algorithms and calculations, and then um, it turned out things were not as good as they looked at that time for any of the Nordic or Baltic states. Um, and so this, this slide shows um, some of the results. Um, none of them are good basically. So the take home message from the, from the EPI for the Nordic and Baltic states is that it shows a lot of unsustainable forest management and deforestation and fragmentation. Um, Latvia currently, as of 2018, ranks 37th um, in, in terms of the 20 performance indicators, but 137th in terms of forest management. So um, that's out of 180 countries, so it's um, close to the lower uh, percentile. Um, and so that's a situation, again, I hope that we can see change in the coming years um, with all of the knowledge that we have in this room today. So um, I will be spending um, the rest of this time giving some international examples, um, starting with America first. But um, you could be excused for wondering what America really has to offer to the subject of sustainable forest management when we have a president who says that we ought to rake our forests to prevent wildfires, as he did a few weeks ago in California, where I'm from. Um, this provoked a lot of humor on the internet and in the media. Um, this is one of my favorite responses, a, a woman in Finland with a vacuum cleaner showing us how to manage forests. Just an ordinary day in the Finnish forest, she said. Um, so the reality, and this is a recent article in the New York Times, is that the current administration in, in the United States um, is using some of the recent environmental problems that we have experienced in the United States as an excuse to justify more logging. Um, the good news is that there are others in the same administration reporting, we just released a major import, uh, report on climate change, and this is supposed to be the real culprit in problems like the California wildfires that keep getting bigger and more frequent and more intense and causing more and more problems. Um, the world is warming, and particularly in areas like the American West, which are already quite dry, this has severe consequences for our forests. And on the other hand, it gives us one more reason to conserve our forests because they can perform a major role in mitigating global warming. So this is a nice um, diagram. I think it's prepared by the New South Wales government in Australia on what our goal is when we talk about sustainable forest management. Um, we're looking at natural forests and keeping them as natural as they can be. That means native species and native uh, structure, natural structure for forests. And I encircled on the right, again, when people talk about forestry, typically they talk about wood production and economic objectives only 
but for the rest of this talk, I'll mainly be talking about biodiversity and specifically about birds as indicators. Um, but there are many, many values um, for forests that go far beyond money or even biodiversity. They have uh, social values, cultural values, um, spiritual values, um, eco ecosystem services, um, the list goes on and on, so um, I just wanted to briefly acknowledge that. And I wanted to start with what I consider to be a cautionary tale um, from America, from the United States. Um, some of you may have heard of the bird that's pictured here. It's called the ivory-billed woodpecker. It was, uh, this cover of Science Magazine is from 2005. Um, it was to mark the rediscovery of a bird that had not been seen for 60 years that was native to American forests. Um, and this caused a great deal of excitement um, that we might have a second chance to save this species from extinction. Um, unfortunately, subsequent searches um, have not been able to turn up evidence that there actually is a population of this bird that persists. But we're going to go into this example a little bit and see what we can learn from it, regardless of uh, the status of this bird. I wanted to just show you the original range of this bird. It's in, it had a quite widespread range in southeastern forests in the United States. It also occurred as a separate subspecies on the island of Cuba. Um, so this is basically where the bird was when European settlers came to America. It was a bird that was highly valued by the Native Americans for their bills, which were traded far and wide. They were found far beyond its natural range. Um, and here, here are some of the only known photographs of these birds. One on the, the one on the left is from Louisiana, 1937. It's a male and female pair. And um, on the right is a bird in Cuba in 1948. So the last confirmed widely accepted sighting of an American ivory bill was in 1944. I'll mention this again shortly. And in Cuba in 1950. Seven, I believe, was the last confirmed sighting of this bird. So when there's an announcement of a rediscovery, again, it's, it's very exciting. Um, when they announced the, re, the rediscovery, conservationists, I saw one report that said they had raised $35 million in order to protect this bird. They were able to hire huge numbers of people, statisticians, field biologists, install equipment, every possible thing you can think of to find this bird. Um, and then this is, this is a photograph from a contemporary New York Times article and uh, a colorized image of what the bird, what bird they were looking for. It's about half a meter long and the wingspan is um, three quarters of a meter wide. Um, but unfortunately, all of that effort has not amounted to any convincing data that will take this bird off of the extinction list. And it has a particular place of, I would say, agony for American conservationists, despite the fact that, unfortunately, extinction is very common. Um, this extinction in particular is something I would like those of us involved in forest management and conservation to really think about. Um, and to do that, I wanted to go back in time a little bit to the beginning of what became the fate of this bird. Um, at the end of the American Civil War, basically, we abolished slavery in 19, uh, <laughs> 18, 1865. Um, and this d destroyed the economy of the southern states in the United States. And it opened up the forest to logging, which was mainly conducted by outside companies coming in from the northern states. Um, they used uh, cheap labor in the form of poor whites and freed slaves um, in need of jobs. And they were able to basically deforest something like 80 million hectares of forest over the next 30 to 40 years. And this. This was the time when the ivory-billed woodpecker really got into trouble because they, you know, it's not really forest management, it's cutting down almost every tree. And these birds need, like black storks, large old trees to survive. They're large birds, they have large territories, and they need large trees. Um, in 1937, um, 
that was actually the first rediscovery of this bird. Um, they, some conservationists thought it had already gone extinct by around 1920. This is when, in 1918, 100 years ago, the United States passed the Migratory Bird Treaty Act, and this made it illegal to kill almost all native birds. What it did not do is prevent the destruction of habitat, and of course, habitat is necessary for a healthy bird population, so that alone could not save this bird from what was happening. But there were efforts made in the 1930s when a population was discovered in Louisiana to try to revive the bird and save the habitat it had remaining. Um, these are photographs taken from a PhD student that studied the bird intensively. They're the only known photographs of a nestling of this species. Um, and at the end of this PhD thesis, the student produced a forest management plan that although the forest was already starting to be logged at this time, he believed would save this bird. Unfortunately, the timber company was not interested in saving the bird. And at that time, there were no laws that compelled them to do so. Um, there was actually a pretty widespread conservation campaign launched by our National Audubon Society. They contacted the president, who contacted the secretary of the interior. They got support from four state governors and raised $200,000 to try to buy the land or protect the land, but they could not get cooperation from the logging company or um, the Singer Sewing Machine Company that owned the land. Um, it looked like there was a respite in 1941. That's when the United States joined the Second World War in Europe and most of the cheap labor that had been used to cut down the forest went to Europe. Um, in, in a kind of a strange trade-off, German prisoners of war that were then kept all over the United States were actually used to make the final cuts that probably drove this bird to extinction. So that happened by 1944, and that is the last time um, birds were seen with general agreement and the last time birds were photographed. Um, there was one female remaining when the last researcher had seen one, um, like this bird in the photo. Um, so I just wanted to show some other examples of North American birds that were recently driven extinct as a reminder that it's not only this bird, it's just this bird because we knew so much and we tried to do something and we failed. I think this has a particular place in our history that I hope can give lesson to other forest countries um, that are managing vulnerable birds and other wildlife. Um, the U.S. Endangered Species Act was passed in 1973, so it came about 30 years too late to try to save the ivory bill. But the good news is that it has saved a number of other species, including arguably all four species in this slide uh, would be extinct, in, at least in the United States, without um, the passage of that law. It compelled private landowners, companies, anyone who has a federally recognized endangered or threatened species on their land to protect those species. And not only that, it provides federal money that goes towards protecting the species. And that is key. Um, studies have shown that without funding, uh, people are very hostile to some of these species and would rather just kind of quietly get rid of them. Um, but with federal funding, that can make a really big difference in what um, conservationists are able to achieve. Um, and a pertinent example for forests is the northern spotted owl. So this bird was listed uh, under the Endangered Species Act in either 1990 or 1991. Um, and it was identified uh, logging was a primary threat, and specifically logging in the western United States and wa in Oregon and Washington. Um, there was a huge outcry at that time. It was extremely controversial. Um, a lot of loggers said that they were going to ruin the forest industry, they were going to ruin people's lives. Um, there was a lot of media attention that was not necessarily helpful, but others that were. Um, and there were, there were protests, um, very extreme measures taken by a, a lot of people, people saying that the Endangered Species Act you know, was killing our economy, killing jobs, killing America, um, and all sorts of other uh, a bumper sticker that says, save, an, save a logger, eat an owl, and all, all sorts of um, negative responses. But 
Um, it did save the bird, uh, save a bird that would arguably be extinct now without this legislation. Um, unfortunately, the bird has continued to be to decline as habitat is not the only threat to its persistence. Um, there is also a so-called native invasive. It's another owl species that occupies the same niche that has expanded into the western United States from the eastern United States, probably because the barred owl, which is pictured on the left, is more tolerant of human activities. The spotted owl, the threatened species on the right, um, is much more sensitive. So now there are measures being taken, um, being considered to control the in invasive owl to also contribute to saving this bird. But, so it can be very complicated, but laws and funding um, can make a critical difference between extinction and survival. Um, in the United States also, there's a tremendous amount of research now on specific species and in different region, regional forests. Um, this is an example of a recent paper um, focusing on, in part, the bird in the, that's shown in the middle is Kirtland's warbler. Um, and it's federally listed as endangered. It requires um, forests in a very small area in Michigan. Um, and it's managing for that bird specifically doesn't necessarily, necessarily help other birds, including the birds pictured on the left and the right. On the left is the golden-winged warbler, which needs more open forest habitat, and that goes for the American woodcock on the right. So there, there's constant sort of revision and research going on about how we can best manage our forests to protect all of the birds and other wildlife in them. Um, this is another example of the same kind of study um, for um, a slightly different region. We've got the Viri, the brown thrasher, and the northern goshawk as, as species, I think to, um, three of the 20 species that are considered in this paper. So I think this just illustrates that all, all of the factors vary according to where you are, what species you're dealing with, what kinds of forest management plans you're dealing with. So continuous research um, is, is a key part of this equation. I think, and as is outreach. So there is a tremendous amount of outreach um, that happens as a result of partnerships between federal government agencies, state agencies, conservation organizations, um, and private groups. And it goes to private citizens um, as well as large um, corporations. And so this is all a part of, I think, uh, a pretty good job that the United States is doing more recently in terms of managing forests to protect biodiversity and also meet economic objectives of the logging industry. Um, and I just wanted to, to cap the uh, American example just by looking at some of the recent um, priorities as um, listed by the US Forest Service. So they acknowledge um, climate change, unlike uh, certain members of our government, um, and they recognize the importance of forests in mitigating climate change. Um, they are committed to sustainable forest management for the future, improving forest health, and um, searching for new opportunities to manage uh, carbon. I also want to, in the time remaining, talk about two other regions of the world um, where they have very different political um, and biological context. The first is Ghana, where I spent several years um, doing research on logging impacts on birds there. Um, and this is a biodiversity hotspot. Um, it's considered so because there's high biodiversity and very high human threat um, to this region. And this is a satellite image that shows uh, the remaining forests in Ghana. About 80% of Ghana's forests since British colonization uh, over 100 years ago have been legally destroyed for industrial agriculture, and all remaining forests are in government protected reserves. Um, most of those are used for logging, but it's actually very um, detailed, the forest management plans that they have, and um, uh, we did, I did research on these with a Danish colleague who's picked it, pictured on the left. Um, Lars Holbeck, he's now at the University of Ghana. He did his PhD in Ghana 15 years before I arrived, and we found very different things um, as far as what was happening to the forest and the birds that I'll illustrate now. Um, we 
conducted research pretty much all over the forest region. So th again, this shows the, the highly fragmented state of Ghana's forests. Um, they were kept by the colonial regime and now by the independent government as a way to mitigate um, soil erosion and sort of maintain the climate for agriculture, not really for biodiversity. And um, that's kind of leaving biodiversity out of the equation is usually not good news for the fate of the biodiversity in the forests. Um, we found through our research together that between 1995 and 2010, um, logging in, uh, intensities had increased by over 600 percent. Um, we found evidence of extensive illegal logging, so the intensity of logging had completely changed in the time of our um, of the difference between our two studies. Um, the maximum sustainable rate as calculated by the Ghanaian government is being exceeded um, uh, by over six times. In other words, the country is basically being deforested now. And so we looked at the effects on birds through a misnetting study and a modeling study using the results. Um, and what I'd like you to see in this graph, in 1995, the birds were actually able to recover from logging. You can see um, comparing unlogged and then post-logging situation, they actually increased um, in abundance because of movement um, and stimulation of the forest structure. Whereas 2010, when I did my field research and we compared the data, the abundance fell by over half and then remained low, did not recover. And we think this is because there's so much logging happening in the forest that it never is able to recover. Um, so there were a number of bird community changes over time. I think the most significant for here, um, we, we have a paper with detailed results, but is that over half of the birds in this forest were wiped out over just a 15 year period. That's a very powerful and very negative um, effect and there isn't any sign of stopping. So unfortunately, a lot of these birds may go the way of the ivory bill if um, the government doesn't change and there is no sign so far that the government is interested in, in, in changing, unfortunately. Um, these are just a few individual examples of species that have shown declines over 15 years, in some cases 90%. Um, um, and then almost 40% of birds that were found in 1995 we could not find in 2010. It wasn't a high enough effort to confirm extinctions, but I think certainly some of those birds are already extinct in Ghana. Um, I wanted to end on a slightly happier note. Um, in Peru, uh, where I've also spent several years um, in the field doing research, and where I'm continuing to be involved in research. And I want to talk about two case studies in the northern Amazon region. Um, both are near protected areas, which have been recently created by the Peruvian government. And I, I think it's significant to keep in mind, um, Peru is not a wealthy country, yet it has made very different choices than the United States and Ghana as for how it protects its biodiversity and its forests. Um, the first study I want to mention, I actually did w in an indigenous territory with a group of, um, with an Awaruna Hibero, or as they call themselves, Awahun uh, community. Um, we, they had never allowed, they're very um, distrustful of outsiders for obvious historical reasons. Um, and so I was very lucky I got to be um, included in working with them, and as a result, we, we made a lot of new um, discoveries, new populations, and um, new um, uh, nest descriptions, and so forth. That, um, and we also uh, documented their conservation practices. I, uh, this is a. I like to show this slide. It's not very good photo quality, but there's a river that goes along. There's a rice paddy in the bottom part of the photograph. That's where the Peruvian government has allowed people to colonize up into that area. And you can see what happens when um, these are Andean people coming down um, and kind of um, farming in the Amazon. So you can see what happens when the land is colonized. And on the other side of the river, where it's almost all forest, that's indigenous territory. Um, and studies have shown that um, indigenous people are very good at, at saving forests. 
Um, they also have an um, extremely high cultural knowledge about birds that compares, uh, that has about 80% agreement with scientific data. Um, and so we, again, they do log this area. It's commercial logging, um, but it's extremely low um, intensity. So we study the impacts of the logging by misnetting birds in logged and unlogged forests. These are some of the birds that we caught and released. Um, and we basically found that the species richness remains stable. Um, it doesn't significantly change over time. So the, co the composition changes, but the species richness remains stable. So that's pretty good news for forest birds um, in logging areas. Um, and they also have a whole section of their territory that they don't allow any logging or agriculture, only low levels of hunting. So to me, it was very impressive because these are very poor people and um, they never interacted with conservationists or scientists, but they just do this as a part of their culture. So it's, it's also a lesson, at least in my mind, that you don't have to be rich or educated or any of these things to conserve. This is just sort of something that they naturally do. Um, and the final example I wanted to give is um, concerns a Spanish missionary who's pictured at the bottom of this slide, um, who decided to give up being a missionary and become an ornithologist. Now he works for the Peruvian government. He discovered uh, about six new bird species when he was just bird watching, again, in the northern Peruvian Amazon. Um, and he was able to, let's see, he was able to convince the government to close an area that they had just opened up for colonization from new settlers and save it for the birds, basically, arguing that they were confined to just this habitat area. And again, it's, it's not in their economic interest, in my, as far as I can tell, to do so, but the government decided that it was worth saving these species, that they could give people land in other areas, and they did it. And um, to me, that's a good, a good thing to keep in mind. So again, we worked inside this area. Um, it had been logged, and there's some illegal logging there's not very good um, protected area enforcement in Peru. Um, so there's still some logging going on. And again, we captured birds and compared them in logged and unlogged uh, forests. Um, we did find that there are declines in response to logging in this area, but they've basically managed to control a lot of logging happening from now. Um, so this is, a, this is an example, this is a satellite image that shows roads going into this protected area, you can see that outside of the, of the black line, the road is much larger. On the inside, it was like that, and since they basically asked people to leave and, and gave them free land elsewhere, the forest has begun to recover. Um, so it's an example of what can be done with political will. Um, there were still some people living in this protected area, and the uh, this is mainly American money, I think. Um, they've raised money to basically buy them out and encourage them, uh, give them money to buy land elsewhere. So again, it's a, um, there are all kinds of examples where international cooperation can um, contribute vastly to conservation if we work together and listen to each other and learn from the science um, that we have. So. I guess my main take home message um, for all of this today is that timing matters. If in the United States we had acted in time, we would have one fewer bird on our list of extinct species. We did not do that, but I hope that message, I hope that lesson can go out to you in Latvia in a time that is very critical for your forests where you have a chance now to change the future of for biodiversity in your forests. Um, species like the black stork are, whoops, are um, highly endangered. And decisions that are made this year, next year, and the next couple of years can be very critical for the future of these species. And I know that there's uh, more than enough expertise in this country to do all of the right things um, for the forests. And I hope um, that you achieve it so that in the future your people won't have to tell stories like I'm telling you. <laughs> so um, thank you very much. And thanks especially to the Baltic Freedom Foundation again and the um, University of Latvia. And I'm really looking forward to learning from, from all of you today.
Thank you. Shall we, any questions, please? Thank you very much for your presentation. It was quite quite interesting and a lot of things new for me about okay. the United States and so. Uh, my question, I will look at it, I wrote it. Yes, um, at the first part of the presentation, you, you spoke about long-term sustainability as the target for forest management. Uh, and then you continued with this uh, index by Yale University. And as we know, this index, if we talk about forests, it measures only tree cover loss. Mm -hmm. That can occur in two cases. Either this is harvesting or deforestation. And we know that it measures, it fixes the uh, situation in 2008 and, I don't know, 17 or 18 where the other measurement was made. So we see that it's only about 10 years. Uh, is this the right way to compare these things? In my opinion, no. <laughs> I don't, I, I think when I look at that index and I've been in some of the countries that are mentioned, I, it doesn't make any sense to me actually. But I think it's, um, I know that, I believe that um, Morris is going to be talking about specifics of sustainability and cutting in Latvia later. Um, I think. Yeah, personally, I, I do not put much stake in these global indices, but they do make it into the media because they're simple and easy. And um, But some of them, I think one of, like, for example, the Federated States of Micronesia, which is a Pacific Island nation, has like a 100% score with forest management. But it's because <laughs> they, they barely have any forest. I've, I've lived there for a year, and they just, they don't cut forests, but, so they don't show loss, but it's because they have almost nothing to begin with. and. To me, that's a danger of, of these sorts of indices. So they can be extremely misleading if you don't have context. So I, I mentioned because it's, it, it made it into the news. It's important to at least deal with things that make it into the news. Some of them are completely wrong and get talked about in, a, in, a, you know, in an incorrect way, but it's, I just think it's important to acknowledge them. So it's a great question. More questions? Uh, thank you very much for your presentation and uh, it was really useful to see the research papers that you have participated in. Uh, in the beginning uh, of your presentation you mentioned that uh, forest management on private land is, is, um, is uh, with focus on short-term benefits and it's not sustainable. Uh, is it also based on some research that is available to you? I, yes, again, I believe that is based on a analysis that Morris will talk about more, the, the short-term and uh, the, the short-term um, impacts on private land in Latvia. And then also, um, it's, there's also, um, Michael Hudson is an American economist that's, av that's advised the Latvian government on, on economics in general and particularly on forests. And they, he noted and others ha other journalists have noted the difference since 2008, but I think Morris will present, um, has, the, has the details and more information about the Latvian statistics. So, good question. I think. More questions, please? Yes, thank you very much. Okay, okay thank you. Uh, and now I will. Yeah. And now I will ask our another guest. Uh, Michael Manton uh, to tell about pan-European scale. Hello everybody, it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks to Jan, Janis, Maris. Um, my name's Michael, I'm presenting here with Per Angleston who couldn't make it. Um, he's a colleague colleague who I work very close with from Sweden. Um, a little about myself. I'm from Australia, so I'm not from this part of the world. I come from where there's kangaroos and eucalyptus trees. But I'm a forester. Who here is a forester? Can you put your hands up? Oh, so we, we, oh, we have a few foresters. This is good. I'm also an ecologist. 
and look at nature protection. Hands up, who doesn't do forestry? Ah, so we have a bit of a balance here. So, so I try and balance wood production and biodiversity conservation. It seems to me, coming from Australia, it's a bit easier to get my head around it here in the boreal forests. In Australia, there's more than 700 eucalyptus species. There's different species, they all have different niches. Luckily, in the boreal forest for the major tree species, there's not 700 of them. So it presents a little bit simpler. But currently, I work in Lithuania at Alexander Stulginski University, which of next year, so in what, 25 days, I will be part of VDU, because of, there's a university reforms happening, which is the Dortus Magnus University. So it's all happening in Lithuania for, for research and science and university. So today I'm just going to talk about wood production and biodiversity conservation in boreal Europe. So boreal Europe, what I'm talking about here, it's, I'm talking more about this, this darker green section. It's not the exact borders of boreal forests, but we can go into the hemiboreal across here. You have the nemeral, bore, nemeral forest zone also in the bottom of Sweden. But I'll be talking mostly about this forest area today. So within the, the forest area, we have competing benefits or services or things that we want to get out of forests in forestry. So this could be wood production, or it could be biodiversity conservation. And we'll go into that more. I'll also look at birds, again, as focal species. And I'll talk maybe about some possible solutions. But really, what I, what I would like is to try and use this landscape, what we have, not look so much at EU borders, Latvian borders, Lithuanian borders, but to look at it as a landscape. Because essentially, without humans, it is one landscape. So I will progress further. So we look at forest, forest, forests in Northern Europe. This is, what they, this is what they give us if we use the ecosystem service model. They provide us supporting services. So this is really talking about habitats, photosynthesis, soil formations, different sorts of things here. They provide provisioning services. So this is what they deliver to us, clean water, wood, so this is what I'm mainly talking about today, wood production. They also have regulating services, so flood control, cooling temperatures, cultural services. Well, I'm guessing many of you here use a forest for cultural services. That's a bit of, actually it brings you spiritually. Like, I know the Baltics, Lithuania, Latvia, they're the last pagan countries in Europe. And I see in Lithuania there's still a lot of pagan traditions. So it comes back, stems back to culture. So when you look at this, you might look and say, what does fish have to do with forests? Well, rivers run through the forest. Forests shade the water. Deadwood provides fish habitat structure. So, so it really people fish in forests for food. So that's where it comes in there. There's a whole lot of ecosystem services that need to be really aware of. Um, but today I'm going to focus on provisioning, so services, which is really the products obtained from forests, from ecosystems, so, so we can look at food, fresh water, wood, fibre, genetics and medicine. But I'll look at wood production. And I also want to look at some of these supporting services, which is to provide habitats for species and for human well-being. Yes, forests provide us human well-being. I don't know, I couldn't live without a forest. I go there to clean my mind. I'm not sure what other people do, but if you live in the city, every weekend I, I'm out in the forest. And we look at the boreal forest in Europe. We see it's diverse. We manage it for different services, different objectives. We, we can have different age classes of forest. We have different species. We can have coniferous, we can have 
deciduous. Within the coniferous, we can have different, we can have wet elder forests. We can, we have all different types of forests. You can't just bunch it and say, there's the boreal forest, it's one. Within that, there are different habitats. And they're very diverse. And they can be used for different, different aspects. And there is a diverse range of management. So if you have a coniferous forest, maybe you really want to produce timber. So that is your focus. If you have decidu deciduous, maybe you're using this for habitats for species. Maybe it's a, an urban park. There's many different, really many different uses of forests in Europe. And if we look at sustainable forest management, there's three pillars. Economic, so this is really about producing timber and getting economical value. We have the social aspects. It creates jobs, it creates human well-being. It's about how society uses the forests. The forest industry is very important for creating, for driving the local economy in many places and providing jobs and security. But as well, we really have to take care of the environment. As I say, I'm we I wear hats on both sides for forestry and for ecology. And people ask, how do you do this? Because it's very difficult. Well, I try to use this, this sustainable forest management pillars to do this and to weigh up the options of what we need, what's best for the future, what's best for society. It's not about my personal opinions. So, as I said, there's many different forests in, bore, in the boreal zone. And if we look at the development trajectories of forest production in Europe, it's very, very different. So here I give the example of Sweden and Russia. If we look at Sweden, Sweden's first forest policy came about 100, 118 years ago, around the early 1900s. Before that, Sweden has a very, very long history of, of using wood and timber back to the, to the Bronze Age and the Iron Age, using the timber there to, to melt the metal and create things. So then they've, they've introduced the first forestry policy. And as we see, in these early days, Russia was more intense with its forestry, but then the Russian Revolution came along. I'm not a huge history buff with what's happened with the ins and outs of Russia, politically. But you can see with the forestry, we have, we have, we have some studies here that show that after the collapse of the, after the Russian Revolution, forestry went back to wood mining. And it's basically progressed in Russia, forestry, as wood mining. This is not looking at any environmental impacts, not trying to do sustainable forestry. Maybe it was getting a little bit better before the Soviet Union collapsed. I know many people don't like the Soviet Union, and I'm one of them. I, didn't like the I don't like the occupation of, of the Baltic countries. But this really, in a way, helped to preserve forests in the Baltics. I'm not sure how it was done here in Latvia, but in Lithuania, they were actually underwriting how much forest they had when they were reporting back to Russia. That means timber products were being sent from different parts of the Soviet Union to Lithuania, which means they could protect their forests. So it's, it's quite, a, quite interesting how the traje trajectories to what we have now have, have come about. Whereas Sweden, on the other hand, it's really gone on intensive forest management. We're trying to produce timber sustainably for profit in a sustain sustainable way. And if we look at just how sustainable and what the mean wood production is per year in, well, northern Europe, I took this from the European Forest Institute, we see that southern Southern Sweden, dark blue, forest management there is extremely intensive. 
Same with southern Finland. Latvia is not so bad. Estonia is not so bad. I cut off the bottom of Europe. It's not in the boreal zone. wasn't interesting for this talk. But what I don't get is half my map's grey. Why is my question. Ah, that's right, Russia. We, we can't represent Russia. So we only get a small picture of what, basically, six countries. It, it doesn't show us that much except that, OK, Sweden and Finland are much more intense than Latvia. So I sort of look at it and think, OK, it's misrepresenting. So we made a study um, looking at forest loss, forest intensity across Europe. So these dark green areas up the top, that's the last intact boreal forests, basically untouched forest in Europe. That's all it left, is left up the top. So there's, when you come down into Latvia, latitude of Latvia, there's, there's nothing left. It's all basically mountain. The areas in Sweden are mountains and in Russia is very isolated. But if you look at this, this is very coarse at a 50 by 50 kilometer grid scale. You can see the different, the different um, forest loss. So 94% 90, of the loss here is from forest harvesting. There's also wind throws and other natural events in there, but 94% is logging. So we see a diverse a diverse forest, forest history and the diverse really effects of forestry throughout Europe. So I think this is, this is, this is quite good. And these circles with the, with the letters, these represent different study areas that we have in throughout Boreal Forest Zone that I'll talk about today. If you go and dive in a bit further and actually take these study areas, we can, we can, just plotting the forest age distribution by species type. So we have bird slug in middle of Sweden on the left, going across in latitude to, to Komi Republic. We can see that the forest age distribu distribution is quite unique and very different for the places. Okay, so for Latvia, it's only Zemgali planning region. This was part of a project we had with the Swedish Institute. And then we go to the top of Belarus and through Skov to Komi. Now, not only do you see the age distribution, you see the species distribution. In Sweden, through forestry, it's, con it's coniferous now. It's completely coniferous. During the 60s, they were spraying with airplanes to wipe out any deciduous. This is why they have so many problems with decidu trying to conserve deciduous species. So it, you can see it's really geared up for forestry. You don't have any really ecological old trees over 120 years. Whereas you get to Latvia, these other, these other countries as we move to the east, we still have some deciduous forests. And as you get to Komi, you have deciduous forests and you have really closer to nature forest with a much older age distribution. So we have some very nice landscapes that provide very different, good differences to learn from. But if we take these, this to the next level and we look at the intensity of wood production on this gradient, well, as it should show, Sweden for forest management, for intensity of wood production, it rates as the highest out of these countries. Followed by Zemgali, okay, Zemgali's not one of the most forested landscapes in Latvia, but it's able to be representative. Then we go to Belarus, and then we skip the border into Russia. Ah, we, we start to go into the, we go into the green. They have a lot of room to, to really intensify wood production. And Komi, well, it's really, as it shows, like a wilderness area. So questions are, what can we do with this information? What, how, do the, how do the trajectories really continue? 
Well, if we take a closer look at Komi, so this is the Komi Republic in, in Russia, one of the last intact forest places. We see current harvesting that's happening. So, yeah, let's see. So this green area here, this is young forest. It's not fields, it's young forest. These yellow, these are more, these are recent clear cuts. Now the size of these squares is 500 metres by 100 by 1,000 metres. So these are large areas. This is wood mining. This is not sustainable. They're just moving in a checker plate as far up as they can go depending on road access. So while some places are actually having intensified sustainable forest management, we also have wood mining happening in different parts of the Boreal Forest. So you have this definite gradient on how things could be done. But as we know, it's difficult to work with, with Russia in all sense of the matter. Um, there's been Swe Swedish companies have tried to actually go there and to help work with intensifying forests in a sustainable manner, but this, this hasn't been successful as yet. So it'll be interesting where this continues well, hope this area here is a national park, so hopefully the movement doesn't continue into the national park, but we will see. So now I'm going to move a bit more locally on forest development. As I said, I'm in Lithuania. I'm very interested on the local agenda in Lithuania. I know it has a very similar history to Latvia, but I think in terms of wood production, you guys are much more advanced. So Lithuania is currently going through some reforms in the forest industry. They had 43 forest enterprises. Now they're going to a, a model similar to what you have here in Latvia. Um, so I'll talk a bit. I'm only looking at independence, so around 1990 to current. So if we talk about Lithuania's natural potential vegetation, so that is this top map on the left hand side, A, this is the natural dynamics for Lithuania. The dark green representing gap, it's really clay soils, high productivity, deciduous forest, naturally. You have this lighter green multi-cohort, multi it's more the sandy soils where you'll have dry pine. And then you have the mixed forests in between. So that's natural potential vegetation based on Bonn who's done a lot of stuff in Germany there. And if you take current forest cover, 33.5%, this is what, how it looks currently. And if you divide this even further and look at private, for, private forest ownership and state forest ownership, you have this as map C. Orange represents private, state represents the green. And if you look at what's protected in both of these categories, well, you don't have much left. And as you'll see, there's a lot of areas, like this is obviously an area along a river, which is in, it's protected, but under private ownership. This sort of shows that maybe the reforms in forestry and forest protection haven't worked very well. I don't really know many places where you can have strict protected areas under private ownership. So. But that's another story for another day. This is, this is currently a, some research I'm working on, which I will also do gap analysis to see how it's changed, the nat what's, what's the difference between natural potential vegetation and the current system and where there's gaps. But if we look at wood production in Lithuania, 1990, great year, independence. We all celebrate this. For the forest industry, it was slow to take off. But slowly it's taken off in, this is volumes of harvesting, this is in um, cubic metres per year. We see that since independence, private industry has really caught up with state forests. So, so this is, means there's opportunity. At the moment, forests are 40% are private, there's 10% still left in the land bank, 
which can be privatised, but the state does nothing with that. It just sits there until it becomes private land. Uh, so it's quite interesting to see that really since 1990, the current forestry has doubled in Lithuania. Forest area hasn't doubled. Forest harvesting has doubled. As a forester, I look at that and think, oh, the dollars, the dollars that have been made from that, this is, this is quite brilliant for the forest industry to actually be able to do that. If it's sustainable is another question. And if you take a look at it and look at um, harvesting per hectare, you see that private, private industry is making more money than, than, the, than the state. And what you see in the private industry is it's affected by financial markets. The state forest, they have a harvesting plan, doesn't matter if there's no market, we're still going to cut it. So you see the differences between private and state forestry. And then if you look at um, value-added products per hectare, it's basically gone from 50 euros a hectare in 2005 to around 400 euros a hectare. So that's great for business. Real, real good improvement. So as a forester, you'd be pretty happy with these results, I, th I think. And then we currently, I went to a seminar last week and the Finnish company Puri, they had a, did a consultancy for Lithuanian forests to see what, what can be improved. Well, cover, current harvesting levels, they can be lifted. They're not, they're not, they're way below the maximum sustained removable volume of timber. So you guys can harvest more. Um, this, this should be an increase of around 15%. There's also room for market improvement, there's room for industrial development, maybe bioenergy plants, um, different things like this. So from a forest industry point of view, an extra 15% looks pretty rosy. But I've dealt with Puri before when I was a forester and really, do they have any environmental considerations? Well, what about these guys? What about, what about species? What about biodiversity? From, his, from their half an hour speak, there was not one mention of the environment. So now I'm switching to an ecologist for the last part of the, the, the talk. So yeah, what about these guys? What has happened since 2000 in countries? like the Baltics where I'm guessing Latvia had a similar trajectory in forest production, maybe a bit earlier than Lithuania. So what has happened to species? How, how does it look? Well, we know consequences on biodiversity. We know there's land degradation. We just got to look at Sweden. We just jump back across the Baltic Sea and we see land degradation, losses in boss of biodiversity, changes in species competition, composition, both for fauna and flora. So basically the picture here shows that on the right, the forest was functional. As we harvest, re we reduce its functionality and this affects species. In Sweden, the f one of the flagship species is the white back woodpecker. It's basically, you can call it extinct unless you call one bird popping in and out, maybe from Norway as a population. And this really, in Europe, it's triggered policies, international, local level. So now I'll have a look, about, look at some of these initiatives and policies. So we have a, EU brought in the green infrastructure policy around 2013. It's about producing strategically planned network of natural and semi-natural areas. And these areas should be managed to deliver a range of ecosystem services. So what this means is both wood production as well as biodiversity and other services. And, this in, and these are in the forests, in forest areas. It's present in rural and urban green areas. It's not green infrastructure in the US sense or the traditional sense of only in urban areas. It's throughout the landscape. It's a very key document that needs to be sort of appreciated that that's one of their strategies and visions. Another one is if we go internationally as well is the Convention of Biological Diversity, the 
HE targets? Well, if you look at target number seven, by 2020, areas under forestry are managed sustainably. Well, obviously there's different def definitions of this. If you ask people in Russia, if you ask people in Sweden. So this is, what, that's two years time. Is that a realistic target? I'm not sure, but that's something we should be working towards. Then you have target 11. By 2020, at least 17% of terrestrial areas of importance for biodiversity and ecosystem services are conserved. And this really is talking about ecologically representative. So what sort of, not introduced species, looking at what is, what is really there. And they should be well-connected systems of protected areas. So this is a really big target. I know Lithuania is not meeting this target that's been written in reports, but what are the outcomes of this? Is there any outcomes if they're not meeting it? Is there any, any sort of reward for meeting this target? That's another question. And if you take a look at Sweden on a local level, Sverskov, largest state forest owner in Sweden, they've come up with the eco parks concept. So it's basically a landscape of around 5,000 hectares with con continuous land. So, and it has high conservation values. It's managed for high, with high, for high ecological ambitions. So this means they're actively managing the area. Forestry, they don't do more than 50% harvesting within the area. I think the average is 36 currently. And they actively manage it. They, they reintroduce fire. They make sure they have cattle grazing. They try and really nurture these landscapes to, to add value. Um, it's only been going since 2010, so it's a bit hard to manage to actually evaluate how well they're doing at the moment. We're trying a project to actually evaluate the eco parks versus reference landscapes and other areas to see how they make a difference. But that's just one example of, a, of what the state forest company in Sweden's doing to try and improve the situation. But if we, if we take a look at birds, how do, we, how, how do we define what birds we look at? They all have different niches, they have different habitat requirements. These are just four resident species in the boreal forest. Hazel grouse, white-back woodpecker, capricelli, three-toed woodpecker. They have different habitat requirements, um, different home ranges, and to try and actually define this information of what they need can be quite difficult. So when we look at forests, we need to think more than just forests, just trees. We need to actually try and look through species eyes of what, what do these guys want. Why do I pick these? Because they're resident. If you look at, take the white-backed woodpecker, they say it's a, it's a specialised species, it's an umbrella species. So if you can protect that species, because it's one of the most demanding species, it will protect other species. So this is a good way to start. And if we take this, this picture again, it was about wood production, but you can also turn it around and make it about biodiversity conservation. So the opportunities for biodiversity conservation are much better in Russia, Skov, compared to Sweden. But in, in another study, we, we expanded Latvia to include, Zemgali to include all of Latvia, to, just to, to see what we get. And we find that, well, forest production, or using wood indicators, we see that Latvia is not too far behind Sweden. It's catching up quite fast. I guess this is very much to do with the Swedish forest management infiltrating into Latvia. And biodiversity, it's on par, but personally, I think there's much more biodiversity in Latvia than there is in Sweden. But for this study, based on using forest age and forest types and forest class, that was equal. But then we go into, again, into Belarus and into Russia and we, we see. So what's going to happen, I suspect, is that intensity will lift 
to a more closer to a Swedish model, but as the red arrow comes across, shows the intensity, and biodiversity will drop down. Now, I hope I'm wrong. Maybe I'm wrong, but we will see. So that's that's if we keep follow if a Swedish model is continued to be forest without good nature protection introduced. Now, just skipping back to Sweden, so we're really going on a journey through Europe today. Is the red areas a high conservation value forest? So these are voluntary protected and protected areas only in Sweden. This is the representativeness of them if you look at them on a map. So you see most of it's in the northern part of Sweden in the mountainous zones. Funny it should be there. That's where the mountain, where, that's really where the logging frontier is in the, at the moment in Sweden. So hopefully they're protected and safe. That's how far north it's, it's, it's got. And what we did, we did some modelling to look at some proxy species. So we used the areas of these protected areas and to see how connected they were, how functional they are as green infrastructure. So first we did a, we looked at an area size. We want patches of five hectares and to see. I'm not sure it's very visible, but there's some light blue on there. These are cold spots. It's like a hot spot and cold spot map. So the red spots are hot spots. And that's, they're really where you'd concentrate your concert conservation efforts to try and join them up. The blue areas you'd skip. There's, there's not much biodiversity. There's no protected areas in there. So they're cold spots for diversity if you look at what's protected for the protected area network. If you bounce this up and make the requirements higher, 50 hectares. 50 hectares is a great size for many species of birds. Gives large enough home range size, patch size. You, you start to see the really how fragmented and the, how it's not representative in southern, southern Sweden is basically missing out on having any sort of functional protected area. So you don't focus on the blue spots again because there's nothing there. You better to start where there's something and try and connect the dots with the red, with the red spots. So that's just looking at functionality of Sweden's high conservation value forest. So if you want to visit good forests, with high conservation value forests and sea lots, go to northern Sweden. Southern Sweden, no. Okay, so, so before I get to there, I just want to sort of ponder, what do we want from forests? What do you want from forests? What does society want? People who are foresters here, you represent really society. You're not here just to make a dollar, to make a buck. You're really representing society. Are forests worth more than just euros and production on the day? What is biodiversity worth? Do we want biodiversity? Do we need it? What's it for? What holds for, what holds for the future? It's, there's, there's many questions out there. I, I take um, a look at the Bavarian State Forest Company in Germany. It was recreated under reforms in 2005. It's here to conserve nature, improve profits, and serve society. So what they found was they lost a lot of biodiversity. They had monocultures. They're just plantations of pine or spruce. And what they, what they did was, OK, we banned clear cutting. We minimized planting. We do this by having selecting cutting. We really want natural regeneration. And they've been able to do this, so revenue is, is stable. They haven't lost any, any, any income. And what they found is their forests are returning to natural mixed stands, and they're getting increased biodiversity. So they're really sustainable. They're very happy. The landscape photo, you don't see any clear cuts. So they're, they're very happy and feel that they've reached a sustained forestry level. But, so this is a really good example. And clear cut's not always the best way to go. In some, depends on the objectives of the forestry. So my conclusions are, yes, biodiversity and, in, and forestry or wood production, they are competing. That's very clear objectives. That's very clear differences here. Um, but it also shows, 
as Sweden that the net effect of biodiversity conservation efforts, so tree retention, voluntary set-asides, woodland key habitats, protected areas, it's not enough to preserve all the species or even some of the species. So we need to really prioritise our objectives. But Europe, it provides a great playground. Like, I'm a researcher, I'm a forester, I'm an ecologist. Europe is brilliant. I can go and look at really good sustained yield forestry management. I can go and look at poor forestry. I can look at places where they have all these species, where there's no species. You can actually learn from each other if we can get collaborative learning. And this is where I think it's sort of a good forum today is hopefully I'll meet some I'll meet some good people here from Latvia and we can look at doing something with Lithuania and maybe Sweden and, and other places. And there's two other another hot topic is do we do land sparing or do we do land sharing? So land sharing is more like the Bavaria approach, land sparing is actually setting aside. These are different things we can we can look at. So, and that's where I will finish up today. Is that the right time, Yamas? <laughs> Is it 10 minutes for questions or? No, there's 10 minutes till Maori's presentation, so there is time for questions. Uh, yeah, I can, okay, I will just go. I, I just have a couple of other studies Is which fits with forest management in Europe. Is this is, we'll talk about wolves, we'll hear about wolves later. So this is large predator occurrence in Europe. This is looking at wolves, bear and lynx. This is just their occurrence. As we see, the bad guys are all in Russia. And there's not so many in, as we move to the west. Okay, we have a re reintroduced population in Sweden. So you see there's, there's also, not only is there a gradient in forest management, but you also have a gradient in large carnivores. If you go to large herbivores, so red deer, moose, roe deer, that all these species impact, you see that you have a, a gradient as well from one species basically in Russia coming to two, coming to three. And this, this, and the moose population in Sweden is, it's way up here. The cause of this is really Forest management, lots of young, lots of food, we can say. So, and now we can have questions. This is just sort of how everything relates. If you don't have the wolf, you'll have too many moose. If you have too many moose, you won't get old ecological trees growing up because the moose will eat it and you can lose, lose your bird species. It's, so it's sort of nature's balance in a way. So, thank you. please. Uh, thank you for presentation. My name is Mars Leop. I am a Latvian um, forest certification council. Uh, and uh, I just uh, one question I have about this uh, Komi forests. Yeah. Uh, do you know about certification of FSC certification in those ter territories? Or? Actually, I'm not 100% sure on the certification, what's happening with certification in Komi forests. Uh, I know this is very huge territories are certified yep. by FSC and the FSC, this is uh, we all of us now, this uh, uh, background of this certification system is sustainability principles. Yep. And this could be, you know, I very wondered about this, uh, you know, so uh, yep. how I, as you said, this is forest mining, you know. It's, it's, it's a very good question and something that probably Thank you. many people that could be explored more. What's, is there anything happening on the ground to prevent this? And maybe FFC, somebody like this, is somebody that can actually do, look into this and do something. But. More questions, please?
Okay, uh, I'll just try to speak loudly. So, uh, uh, considering your experience from Lithuania, um, uh, do you know if there is any attempt to set the national targets for the conservation, uh, uh, cons cons conserved areas of forests? You mentioned, it, for example, the Vichy uh, criteria. Yeah. So, I understand at the moment they are, well, if we look at FFC, they had a generalized standard there for forest management. And basically, the state laws were more strict than the FFC standard. So that just raises more questions there. But they do have this target. They are trying to adapt and do this 17%. But it's very difficult because they still have inherent systems from that have been entrenched from the Soviet past. They still have people from the Soviet era working who are stuck in their thinking. They have new people coming in. They're putting protected areas on top of protected areas on top of protected areas and then they don't know what they can do with them. So I think this is going to take Lithuania some time but they are trying to formulate targets of, of what to meet. I'm not exactly sure they know how they're going about this but they are trying to, to amend the problem. So I'm not sure if I really answer your question but More questions, please. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, now I am asking Maris Trust to continue. It's very nice to see so many people here. I would start with saying big thanks to our foreign guests because without their presence, this event would never gonna happen, specifically Nicole, who came all the way from United States just for this present meeting. And uh, I'll I, I, I want to talk about one subject where uh, we could be actually uh, proud. Uh, Latvians are typical by complaining that Estonians are always better, always first, always this and that. And this is one case where we are first, we are better, and maybe we are better uh, in much larger scale. And I'll use, uh, we had very interesting conversations also with colleagues from Lithuania, or Australia, whatever you uh, take it, uh, about Soviet past and Soviet mentality. And, and one of my Soviet mentalities is I'm using quotes. And I will have some in, in this presentation uh, from different sources. So this one is from forest, uh, Latvian forest policy. There will be a special talk uh, about forest policy later today, so I will not uh, go into details. Uh, you all know this document, and if, if there is anything wrong uh, with English, in this, this is how it stands in that document, so, because it is printed so long time ago. And uh, with a stress on these words about the future. And here is another quote. Uh, unfortunately, I uh, could not find uh, time to get really author of this uh, song. But um, if you think uh, that way, uh, then actually we are living in the future. Uh, and if there are a lot of things, uh, if you look back and start looking on uh, prospects, promises, uh, calculations, which have been done some time ago, 
then we are able to check them uh, in reality. Uh, one of such documents which can be used as a uh, historical cross-check is the same forest policy. But when it comes to uh, forest conservation, then the history is, of course, much, much, much more longer than that. And actually, uh, the current state of our forests is a result of efforts and errors made by many generations of politicians, foresters, owners, well before us. I want to remind most of you, you know, you should know it, uh, especially forester side of this audience, that only next year we will start exploring pines that have been started to grow in independent Latvia from 1918. So far, this was Tsar time production. Uh, brief reminder to uh, simply to those who uh, have forgotten. Uh, the first established nature reserve is Moritzsala. Uh, the first forest act, 1923. The second forest act, which includes also conservation forests, uh, 1937. Then in Soviet time is reorganization, one of many reorganizations of management system and approval of protected territories. Uh, First National Park, Gauja, designated 1973, and uh, two subsequent years, 1977 and 1987, uh, is extension of this protected territory network, and 1977 is also beginning of micro-reserve designation, uh, which is the main part of my talk. Time is absolutely the major uh, forest conservation challenge. Uh, the problem is that governments uh, and even regimes, uh, political regimes operate for relatively short periods of time if we consider the time scale involved in forest. And uh, the problem with these political units is that they often, not necessarily always, but often find the previous one has done everything wrong or a lot of things wrong uh, and it should be turned upside down. And uh, so in order to be successful, if you want to be successful as conservationist, uh, you have to be able to deal with all of them. Uh, otherwise, uh, if you fail, you start from zero. And here is a reminder uh, of uh, political regimes that have operated in Latvia in 20th century. Uh, I have split the Soviet period into four because they were in many ways very different. So until a uh, big deportation of 1949, then until Stalin's death, then Brezhnev times, which is the longest uniform period uh, in the 20th century. And uh, up to now, it is considered uh, as one, but you know there are very many uh, governments operating in that period. So before this micro-reserve story, there is something to keep in mind, because that is uh, not all of you probably know. Uh, here is uh, from two uh, different uh, time charts indicating uh, what is uh, the time scales involved and the lower bar shows uh, age of trees in a really good copper kelly lake. The second one is uh, limits of uh, trees uh, suitable for black stork to build a nest upon. The middle one is average age of black stork nest in Latvia. And I have to stress that it is longer than any political regime in 20th century, not talking on governments. And this is important uh, because uh, not just uh, these uh, 
political background is important, but also biological background is very important to make the right decisions. So, so how can I go back? Because there was something missing. Okay, no. Okay, I skipped that. Uh, uh, the, the, the missing part was uh, that uh, in Belgium, uh, the average use of a nest, uh, uh, the average use of a stork nest is 1.7 years, while in Latvia it is uh, 15, more than 15 years. And if you take uh, the re-election period in each of these two countries to compare, then a stork nest in Belgium is more than twice shorter lived than election, which means uh, you can uh, operate within one election period, while in Latvia it is the other way around and three times longer. So uh, it is not only the political difference which matters in this case, but also biological difference, uh, talking on the same species. So. Uh, I will just briefly uh, run through some most important uh, things affecting biodiversity, and it is not conservation. It is, first of all, uh, the same political background which plays in a big picture, and then, of course, uh, economic activities, which is cutting, in, uh, cutting intensity, which is uh, drainage, and conservation is only really the, f the, the, the final call. Uh, in Latvian, I would say, plaks der smirvanin, which very often doesn't help. Uh, here is uh, a broad impact on forest cover of these big political uh, events. So land reform in 1920 and restoration measures after World War I and deportations of 1949 resulted in increase of forest cover. Drainage uh, was most intensive in Soviet period, reaching really immense figures and has dropped uh, afterwards uh, almost to zero and I have no uh, information about what is happening. Now it is happening again, but, but uh, at least I didn't look for the data. And of course, uh, as far as forests concerned, the most important aspect is cutting intensity, so the volume harvested. Uh, the two gray bars show uh, both world wars. It doesn't mean that there was no harvesting, uh, specifically during the first one, it could have been pretty significant, but, but there are no data uh, available for, for, for that period. And uh, uh, running a little bit ahead, uh, because this is a, a presentation of a data set from much later period, but I, <coughs> I believe uh, those people involved in formulation of this micro-reserve concept were uh, sort of discussing this issue without having data uh, I'm presenting now. But it is pretty obvious that if you have a species that is living uh, in, in some sort of isolation relatively or quite far from each other, so be it pears or legs or, or uh, anything else, you cannot have many in one place. Then this place must be huge and then it is not place anymore. So uh, here are examples of two uh, big uh, forest dwelling birds, let's say spotted eagle and black stork, and neither of them occur in, in significant numbers in, in Natura uh, sites in Latvia. So, the concept of micro reserve uh, did not emerge from nowhere. So there are, there are concrete people behind it. Unfortunately, uh, 
they all have left this world before they were interviewed on details uh, how, who, who really mentioned first uh, and then how it was developed further. So there is some speculation. Uh, I have been talking uh, specifically on this issue with Janis Wiksne, but he did not remember. But uh, the three people who are behind the first mentioning of this concept as such, and I would like to stress really this is not taken from any other country, this is made in Latvia, is Janis Baltwilks, the same whom quite a few people know as a poet, uh, Janis Wiksne, and uh, head of the laboratory of ornithology, uh, Harris Michelsons. I think a quite important aspect uh, of this is Harris Michelsons uh, has studied forestry in Jalgava uh, Academy of that time, and both uh, further mentioned Leon Svitols, Minister of Forests, and Juris Matis, who was head of uh, Forest Inventory Institute, were his study mates. So they had very good contacts uh, also during later work. And uh, I believe that two things have played important role. At that time, uh, a approach to pro not to protect but to maintain copper kaili leks uh, in forests in the whole of Soviet Union was hanging in the air. So I have not found so far the year when this concept was issued and was legally uh, started to operate. But uh, it might have been the subject, uh, for example, Harris could contact either Juris Matis or Leon Svitos or both of them when they had this joint project on, on uh, Red Data Book uh, for Latvia. Um, Institute of Biology was uh, conducting this project. Uh, the major uh, implement implementor, so to say, of the concept in, in reality is Juri Slipsbergs. I hope he's here. No? Anyway, uh, he, he deserves absolutely full credit for for start of this uh, system. And the, the very first micro-reserve was designated 1977. The very first mentioning is six years earlier, so 1971. But I think that behind that uh, reason, need to do something, was the situation in Latvia after two major hurricanes, 1969 and 1967. Uh, there was a lot of uh, impact of active forestry. You see, uh, the, it's not really cutting intensity, it's uh, amount of uh, timber collected because most of it was obviously already on ground. Uh, but there was very big disturbance, uh, questioned foresters uh, even 20 years later often said we had everything until the storm and after the storm we have nothing and so on. So this could have pushed the whole idea of doing something while it is still possible as Nicola pointed out, not to be too late. And here is simply a reminder how a very strange Copper Cayley Lake may look like. It's a forest where the uh, forest is completely burned. It is left standing and Copper Cayley still use these uh, dead trees for display. Uh, Initially, uh, this project between Institute of Biology and Ministry of Forest uh, ended 1983. 
And then after that, uh, during work of Breeding Bird Atlas, uh, actually these proposals, uh, search for nests and designation of objects was done by very few people. I was working at that time in Forest Inventory Institute and at a large extent by support from Juris Matis. Uh, we, within a couple of years, reached situation that I was summarizing all this information, submitting to Ministry of Environment, or, sorry, Ministry of Forests, uh, and uh, at the very end, uh, it was almost myself who prepared these uh, documents for signing to minister. 1990, uh, 1988 and 1989, uh, I think two or three people have contributed to, to these lists of renewal of known territories or establishment of new ones. As you know, 1990, things changed gradually in all aspects. And uh, after that, we became suddenly in completely new reality. And that was affecting everything, including uh, nature conservation at large. So uh, that obviously, uh, that attitude of people in government reflected in uh, actions taken and actions not taken, uh, and a lot of things until up today. Uh, so the designation uh, of micro-reserves after extensive data collection was renewed only 1996. Then the next uh, issue was 1997, and after that already completely new era uh, uh, with new forest legislation would begun. But uh, before going into that, uh, the question on whether uh, or not something what is happening is sustainable or it is in long term or not uh, has been always active so somebody often asks this sort of question and, and it is really important uh, to put any figures in the context so if you just say three here is it a lot or is it little well it depends if it's your soup then it is a lot if it's your head, not very much indeed. So numbers itself tell very little. Uh, and I, I needed exactly that sort of information. It was very briefly after year 2001, cannot say exactly, but it was sort of end of 2001. Uh, and I, I made a very simple mm, snapshot of the situation. It doesn't say anything more than that moment. Uh, to see the speed of cutting, to make it simple, uh, the annual, not volume, but area, felled by final cutting. Basically, it's only clear cuts, but it does include sanitary clear cuts and all, all types of cutting where all trees are being removed. And uh, use that area versus all the remaining forests. Simply checking uh, how many years would the same speed last to, to go on. And uh, the average rotation period is calculated from proportion of all three species uh, which we have because they have different cutting age, and then it creates this overall figure of 81 year. If that figure you get is bigger than 81, it means everything is okay. If it's smaller, it's not quite okay. And the red colored uh, figures indicate uh, not sustainable, but I stress this is a snapshot. This is one moment picture. It actually uh, tells nothing on what has happened before and what is going to happen just after. You can change that cutting in the next year and, and all these figures are completely useless. So 
simply, I'm explaining this, uh, this approach, but it does show that at the moment of around year 2000, private forestry was doing a bit tough, while state forests were in, except for some uh, administrative units where there are not so many forests, actually, uh, it was doing very well. Uh, further, with changes of legislation, I will not uh, read all these uh, documents and dates, you know it, but there are some uh, aspects on top of that when this uh, preparation of new legislation came. Of course, all sides were working to get in important aspects uh, which was wanted or needed. And because we uh, just elaborated the first uh, conservation action plan for Copper Cayley, we organized a workshop involving a Copper Cayley expert from Gros uh, Great, Great Britain, Pete Mayhew, in Smilton, if I remember correct. And uh, a lot of people, both from ministry and from forestry uh, units, uh, participated uh, simply to see habitats, requirements, and everything. And uh, after about two weeks, after this workshop, we had a discussion group, working group on uh, defining these uh, micro-reserve regulations. Since almost half of the participants uh, of that working group were present in the seminar, um, it uh, made me life much easier than otherwise because I could simply rely, you all knew what the bird really requires. And then there was some kind of uh, hesitation, debate, and I asked for personal vote uh, on this issue, specifically on Copper Cayley, uh, promising that I will publish all those who will vote against Copper Cayley. Nobody did. So that is actually how uh, the current uh, stand on Copper Cayley Lake uh, position in micro reserve. reserve uh, uh, regulations took place. It's long ago and okay, if, if anybody did not know it yet, then okay, then, then you know. If you have to blame somebody, blame me. Uh, the current designation under new uh, legislation started uh, 2001, but before uh, further process, uh, when this discussion was, so to say, just beginning, we got a question from then, it was not Ministry of Environment, I think it was Commis uh, Committee of Nature Conservation, uh, I don't remember this uh, administrative name, Indul Semsis was head of it, and he uh, contacted, uh, I was then representing uh, Ornithological Society, uh, to present some idea uh, how much, which species would this, so to say, target of micro-reserve designations be. Uh, I don't remember uh, who else was involved in uh, discussing and defining, well, defining is not the right word, so it was a sort of common uh, agreement on what should be uh, necessary and what could be realistic. Uh, I did submit that list, but I was not uh, the only one making it. So uh, you may not look on the right-hand side so far, but the first two uh, columns, number and area, is exactly that list which we then proposed, so it is year 2000 or even uh, 1999, so exactly before this new legislation was to be implemented. And uh, 
sometime later, already 2008, I made the first check of uh, how much is done in the meantime and what have happened. So uh, here you see the percentage of this area as a ratio to the planned area, so to say, what we wanted and what we have got at that time in place. The target area of the whole country is 2.3%. Because Copper Cayley was uh, politically quite significant uh, from the very beginning, and also because it was from the very beginning forming the largest uh, uh, micro reserves by area. Uh, State Forest Service made sort of decision that uh, all the lakes which were registered at the time had to be turned into micro reserves as the legislation required. And these were mostly uh, forest. Uh, I don't know how to translate this uh, position properly, but people who were responsible for hunting in each uh, state forest uh, uh, Anyway, uh, you know most of these people by name, but, but these were not uh, the current uh, ecologists or, or experts on species. Uh, then these were mostly people dealing with, with, forest, uh, with hunting issues. And uh, this is already representing the situation uh, eight years later, uh, 2016. These are simply uh, different uh, experts, and the yellow bars represent those uh, forest uh, ecologists who are designating micro-reserves simply and just for copper Cayley. So basically, they, are, uh, they, they, they fulfilled this regulation of uh, ministry uh, to do so. Uh, what is sort of takeaway messages from this. The first one, and I presented this uh, also to international audience, so basically that's why it is uh, made initially, is that to make anything like that happen, you have to consider also a very long time. It has taken 30 years from idea to its full implementation, and it has taken another 10 years uh, to make it really going on like it is going on now. And even if it is uh, many uh, experts involved nowadays and uh, it's not dependent anymore from activity of one or two uh, interested uh, persons, it is still uh, pretty uh, slowly and the top uh, more than half micro reserves are designated by less than 10 people. So uh, the current, and it is as current as 18th of November this year, the uh, number of micro-reserves uh, is 2,525, with total area of 44,700 hectares. As you all know, and this is uh, often a topic of discussion or debate, do we need uh, two different uh, kinds of uh, protection area networks, and are they, mm, how, how do they fit each other and how do they work together. So here is one example uh, of area, and this, uh, it's visible on, on screen, this light blue crossed territory is Natura uh, site. The, uh, area with blue is Copper Cayley uh, network, Copper Cayley <coughs> micro reserve, and this other one uh, to the right is Black Stork micro reserve. So one thing which is very obvious here, because Natura is, so to say, big bird, it has almost always straight fixed borders which not necessarily correspond to real borders of that particular environment, habitat or so. 
and sometimes, uh, as in case of this, one of the values why this Natura site was established is that, that lake, and you can see that the big part of that lake is actually outside that Natura site. So uh, micro reserve gives a possibility to be more specific, precise, and also to exclude uh, unnecessary parts, while if you make big territory, then it is usually not possible. Uh, the other side of Natura is that, as any big uh, system, it is partly a showcase uh, rather than a really functional uh, network. And we did some analysis of uh, Natura network in relation to uh, one specific non-target species for microreserves, hazel grouse, a bird that was showed also in previous presentation as a boreal forest specialist bird, uh, non-migratory, living on sites, needs old forest. And uh, you can find these statements in Latvian in uh, Hazel Grouse Conservation Action Plan. Simply I want to stress that there is more than just Hazel Grouse Action Plan, but the short message uh, is that certain types of or big network which creates very nice, beautiful, large numbers of protected in brackets territories is completely useless from point of view of real conservation. The, the only function is really to make big numbers on paper. Uh, I did recalculate again what has happened until uh, 2016 and pay attention to, the, to this figure, which is the first one exceeding 100 percentage. But the difference why it has happened is not increase of micro reserves, but decrease of black stork numbers. Uh, I'll come to that back a little bit more in detail. So uh, some words about what does conservation success means is it's not just to make a site to designate in one system or another system. Uh, we hardly can speak about loss of forests in Europe. Uh, in Latvia, absolutely not. Uh, but even in other countries, it is mostly not the case. But there are very, very few forests where a site quality is not an issue. And uh, to understand this uh, human perspective, and I mean, uh, in this case, absolutely literary human perspective, is not always appropriate. If we look on a forest, a Kapercaili Lake, which is affected by drainage, from human standpoint, it's pretty normal forest. But if you switch to position where Copper Cayley stands, which is 40 centimeters from the ground, then it looks completely different. And then the same landscape suddenly appears to be useless because the bird cannot go through. If you look from or heights, we do not even think that this is an option, that this could be a problem. Uh, there is more. You know all this very famous quote of Disraeli, there are three kinds of lies, lies, damn lies, and statistics. And uh, as I said earlier, and this is not my idea, but figures must be always put in context. So uh, just change in some figure, whichever direction it is, doesn't mean neither good or bad if you do not get that context. Uh, this improvement can be a result of dramatic reduction of population and other way around. You can recalculate population, get better data on population size, which you use as a reference, and suddenly it appears that your conservation success is very bad because the, the figures have changed uh, on the different direction. But to, to take it really seriously, of course, micro-reserves are not equally 
uh, adequate for all uh, types of species. And here we come to sustainability. To see, and this is unfortunately all politicians have messed up completely administrative division, so direct comparison of the previous ones is simply not possible. Uh, there, are, there is no way uh, I could get data and, and put the administrative units on the former administrative units so that they were the same. But I used exactly the same approach with one difference. This time I calculated this average uh, rotation period not for the whole country, but for each uh, Nuovats separately and for each uh, property type separately because there are big differences in uh, tree structure between private forests and state forests in some uh, nodes and uh, other way around. So it was quite time demanding and the approach here is very similar uh, to make it better understandable. Uh, the color tells a lot, so if it's green, perfect. Yellow, okay, almost, almost good or good, just good and orange is already pretty bad and red is really bad. So that's private forests, uh, uh, more correctly, that's everything else but state forest. So it does include uh, municipalities, probably church, probably what else is under this, uh, this statistic, not state forests. Uh, that is a picture for state forests, so if you remember this earlier version was state forest was almost without exception doing pretty well. It is not anymore the case and it is worse than it seems because if we add so-called sanitary cuttings then the picture turns really bad. This is other forests and this is state forests. If you put Natura Network on top of this, then you see that the green Nuovadi are those where there are big protected territories like Sleater National Park, Temeri National Park, Gaoya National Park, where in large parts uh, intensive clear cutting is simply not allowed. And the devil is in the details, like Americans are saying nowadays, if you listen to CNN about the news, you can hear this staying three times a day. It's about Californian fires and about president, about many things, but, but it is really in the details. If from this total list of 118 municipalities, I exclude just 13 with a total clear cut area of 17 hectares, and these are the ones creating mess uh, in the data. If you have just one hectare cut, and if you have 1,000 hectares of forest, then this figure is 1,000 years. You can do it the same way. That's why this snapshot doesn't say a lot. It just shows broad picture of one moment. It would be really, uh, if somebody wants to know what is happening, uh, then all the years could have been put in a row, and if this is a significant trend, then it is really a big problem. Uh, but it's again from the same document from, from Hazel Grau's action plan. Uh, basically, the sanitary cuttings is, uh, in Latvian, dabūšanas uh, cirtas. Uh, and in most cases have very little to do with sanitary conditions. And this is pretty obvious uh, considering situation that the worst sanitary conditions are in all protected territories where clear cuts are not allowed. And that comes from data. It's not just my uh, assumption. And almost at the very end, I'm approaching it, is uh, the situation with micro-reserve designation as it stands uh, 
literary today, one week ago. So you see, uh, black stork protection level has reached 300% because the population is even lower than two years ago. And there are uh, percent-wise improvement uh, also in some other places because of the same reason, uh, because population's uh, estimates are much smaller. And what is really important, not for a single species, this target defined 2001 has been reached today. Not for a single one. Uh, this uh, aspect uh, of sustainability does include uh, not only environment, it does include also uh, some other things and very briefly just a few aspects of that. This is again the quote from, from our forest uh, policy, 98. And it stresses mostly talking on social issues on working places, which is important, but that is not the only aspect uh, from, from the social uh, point of view. It does include also uh, all uh, activities, leisure activities related to forests, non-forestry people have, like berry picking, which is very popular, like mushroom picking. And it does include also what people think or how they treat or consider or sell forest behind their window. Uh, for instance, when they try to either sell their property or especially this is true for guest houses and hotels, if you look on the advertisements, and there are quite a few uh, starting this advertisement, house in a nice place close to the national park or inside the national park surrounded by nice forests. I haven't found a single one uh, advertisement starting that it is surrounded by beautiful clear cuts and uh, tracks of uh, harvesters. If somebody can find it, please pass it to me. I, I want for collection. And uh, one look, I could have extended the data uh, until 2000 and, and until today, basically, because the data comes from research we made on the bilberry distribution. Bilberries are melons, uh, castonism. Uh, and uh, from database, from forest database. So uh, these are bilberry forests. Uh, 2000, and these are Bilberry Forest 2009, and the difference between the two is minus almost 70,000 hectares. Biggest part of it uh, is in the best uh, part, where the best forests, uh, best bilberries are. Uh, sounds absolutely logical that soon we will start paying more for bilberries because they are getting less and less. And that is also a commercial issue uh, because they have yogurts with bilberry and two slides still. Uh, there are some things which really uh, cannot be calculated uh, in, in money. So this is the oldest pine growing pine in Latvia. Pretty solid tree, but uh, how can you evaluate what would one cubic meter of this pine cost? So it is 475 years old this year, still growing. Uh, so I'll repeat, micro reserves have not changed, have not exceeded threshold if there is a problem and they start to seem to be a problem because there is, I don't know, not enough to cut, probably the problem is not in micro reserves, but it is somewhere else. And thank you for attention. Questions, please? Questions? Okay, thank you.
Now we have a break for lunch, one and a half hour. We shall start again at 14 o'clock. And uh, you are, uh, uh, please uh, go to registration desk if you didn't uh, uh, still sign uh, your name there. And you are welcome to University Cafeterium, uh, left side. Uh, from this uh, auditorium. So see you at 14 o'clock, please. <laughs>